tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by June's Journey. Do the stories I tell each week keep you up at night? Well, I certainly hope that I accomplish what I set out to do. But maybe you have to get up early in the morning and that night's sleep is something you need after all. Then do like I do. Take a few minutes to relax with June's Journey. Whether you're on the Android device, iOS, or use Facebook through a PC, you too can take a trip back to the Roaring Twenties and join June on her investigation, not only into the mystery surrounding her sister's murder, but also her family's past. In this hidden object game, you search for clues hidden to unlock the next scene in each chapter, revealing more and more secrets. And not to worry, You'll never be at a loss for something to look for, as new chapters are introduced each week for even more exciting scenes to unleash your inner Sherlock Holmes on. But maybe you're feeling like you could use a little company while you play. Well, June's Journey has that covered too. Join a detective league and go head-to-head -head with other leagues and prove who really is the true Master Sleuth. So, if my stories have got you all worried about what's lurking at the foot of your bed, but maybe unwind with some June's journey before going to sleep. After all, you can always look forward to more exciting cases when you wake up. Yes, friends, join me and the game 30 million fans and counting in the exciting adventure that's free to download. Find your inner detective. Download June's journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PCs through Facebook games. <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 11, Episode 9. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Seth Paul. Tonight you'll hear tales of regretful betrayals, unhappy meals, and medical misuse. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support, and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> The world's changed over the years, and while things like smartphone capability 
in online communication change, how to be polite while using either has not. We're creatures of habit, after all. Sometimes we act in ways that are, well, shall we say, not the best. Let's take our first tale, then, of a fellow recounting the events that have led him to death's door in a very lonely place, and of the one from which he runs. Without further ado, I present to you The Hunt. The following is transcribed from a document located in an unmarked grave discovered and exhumed on the island of Skellig Michael. The document is of particular note because not only does it predate the monastic orders that would have come to dominate the culture of this Irish property, but was confusing due to the occasional lapse of the author into an unknown language later determined to Frankish writing from the 4th century and onwards. It was originally wondered how or why a speaker of a Germanic language would have found their way to such a remote spot hundreds of miles away from what was surely the place of his birth. But as the translation unfolded, the more unusual the story became. It's presented here without further comment. May perhaps here in my final resting place, on this island far from the reaches of all I have ever known and loved, will my story come to a peaceful end. Know that my name is Adelwolf and my brother Erhard, and may the first of these I not speak again, for it is my name that much of what has transpired has happened, and that it is fitting that I write these words in a foreign tongue that still gives me difficulty, for I truly deserve to be a stranger in a strange land. This island overlooks a rough and angry sea. The sea was never a place I imagined for a home, nor a yard, for we were born in what the Romans called Germania, and in that place a fishing lake was perhaps the largest body of water we'd ever seen. We were not fishers ourselves, but hunters, using bow and arrow, knife, and trap to catch our daily meals. I wish I could say we were good lads, but my current state ensures that such is not the case. Our clan traveled often, with little possessions to call our own, and we went as the seasons made us to travel. In winter, we would head as far toward warmer climes as we could, but many others outside of our clan would often do the same, and if we did not heed warnings soon enough, there would be little space to live and hunt without quarrel and violence. If we were larger in size, both in number and body, perhaps we could have held out. But proud as we were, we could not hope to compete in such an instance, and we often wintered further north. We were lucky in that deer would be left behind as well, but boars also gave us trouble, even if the meat was often worth the risk. We were both young men, Earhart and I, in the year when our lives would change forever. The winter snows had melted and the cold bite of winter gave way to the wet coolness of springtime. Grumblings began to spread of discontent and the potential of open warfare among the clans, as Harold, a leader from the southern region, felt he was not being given the tribute he deserved. It was believed he wished to prove his point on the end of the sword. Though we learned much about hunting game, we found ourselves conscripted into the hunting of men. Our skills proved quite useful in training, and then when Harold finally did make his move, proved even more useful in defense. The Romans preferred their open warfare on the field, full colors, and the honor of combat in regalia. We preferred not to play that game, but to hunt as we did game, striking the enemy and retreating, avoiding being seen at all costs. There were forests Harold forces dared not enter. We never wanted to admit anything as strong as pride, but to strike fear into Harold did leave us with a leap in our stomachs. To even think, if we were not well known, our skills certainly were. Erhard, on the other hand, 
grew to enjoy this life far more than I. He was younger, more brash, more desirous to prove his worth, but at the same time he was the one who was closest to giving us away on more than one occasion to the enemy. A dropped arrow here, a kicked rock there, shifting slightly and sending wildlife scurrying for cover. These were the kinds of things that had almost, but never truly, put us in danger. And he never learned from his mistakes. Still, there was no denying his tracking abilities. The way he followed both deer and man alike was astounding, though it was me who more capable of hiding, waiting for something to happen. I had patience. He did not. Our blessings of Providence finally did leave us, just as the chill of winter once again descended upon us. We'd received word that another convoy of soldiers were to head west through the woods we knew so well, and we prepared ourselves for the occasion. Erhard found them when they entered and tracked their way through. They decided to take a well-trodden footpath, a foolhardy thing to do, to be sure. And once he'd followed them and knew what route they'd take, we took up hiding places in trees that lined a small valley where a brook babbled through. The water had worn down and into a thin path, shallow enough to wade, but once in, the only way to travel was to follow the river to its conclusion. The walls were too tall and sandy to make climbing out a possibility. Nobody with any sense, knowing it was hostile territory, would ever have attempted it. We should have realized that there was something wrong with all of this. But as I said, we were young, and despite our skills, we were only human and naive to the idea that anyone would ever try to lure us out into the open. It all went wrong when Erhard, sitting in the crotch of his tree, kicked some bark loose. And then the arrow whistled from across the way, and I heard him gasp before he fell ten feet to the ground. Within seconds, the convoy was upon him, but not, as I feared, to simply run him through and end his life right then and there. No, they lifted him to a standing position, as some distance away the other archer came from the woods, a much older man than either of us, with many battle scars around his face and eyes, and a heavy gray in what beard was uh, still allowed to grow in his damaged jaw. I waited, frozen, watching it all from a distance, as one of the convoy unfurled a scroll and began reading off a list of crimes Erhard had supposedly committed. At least, they would only be considered crimes if Harold became the overlord he desired to be. But Erhard ignored their questions, their attempts to mock him. There were very few of them, and they didn't seem to be aware that the threat of forest came from that of two archers, not one. They paid no attention to the idea that they might still be in danger. But a flight from my arrow never came. I did not know then why I hesitated. I believed in a sense it was fear. In another, it was sort of a punishment for Erhard, a chance to learn his carelessness would someday get us all killed if he didn't change. I watched as they led him further into the woods, away from my position. I followed after, not quite as good a tracker as my brother, but not wanting to lose sight of him. They headed along the brook as expected, but then made a turn where the water split into two paths, and followed this smaller branch as the water continued to dry up, slow, turn brown but oddly opened up further until they reached a small wooden copse. It was not a clearing, for there was still plenty of trees to block the view, no matter where I tried to keep an eye out. But the only real feature of any note was the bog, the thick, marshy surface disappearing away in the distance. We didn't like to be out near this spot if we could at all help it. Supposedly, many years before, we were born in this place used for human sacrifices to appease gods we never even knew the names of. Whether it was the stories, or perhaps just a feeling, or even something malevolent in this place, but the bog carried an aura, a sense of great loneliness. It was dangerous enough to wade in as it stood, without any sordid history to worry about, 
but the sorrow and misery that poured from it only made it all the more wretched. They once again told my brother to confess to his crimes. Earhart refused to answer them, except when asked to name others who helped him on his work. He never mentioned me. He allowed them to believe he was the only one. I think, deep down, he expected me to do what he likely would have done, and taken on the troops with a few well-placed arrows, and rescue him at the last minute. But I never gave him the chance. They bound his hands, his feet, and placed a small, crooked cap on his head. They led him close to the edge of the bog, and forced him to kneel, facing all of them, and in the bargain, me. I think, as they then tightened a noose around his neck, he must have seen me, known I was there, and wondered why I did nothing to rescue him in his last few moments of life. The noose tightened, and as I watched, they each took turns pulling it, freezing the life from him. First his face turned purple, then blue, and then grew paler and more lifeless. The archer took the final turn, whispering something into Earhart's ear, pulling so hard, the rope almost split in two. He held it the longest. I don't know how long the time was. But I felt the tears well, as my younger brother's tongue could no longer fit in his mouth, and he finally collapsed on the ground. His burial was very unceremonial. The crew of soldiers lifted his corpse and dropped it into the bog, with little to no fanfare. With that accomplished, they rested for a short while, then gathered their belongings and went on with their lives. But mine would never be the same again. My brother was gone in such a short time, and in much pain and anguish, and I did nothing to help him. Fortunately for the clan, my services in the fight would not be required after that. Harold, a few days later, Harold was assassinated by his own men, due to a combination of not paying them for their services, as well as a growing discontentment with his future plans. A relative peace covered the land, and due to both that and my own desire to retreat, I was able to find solace in solitude and many a drink. More years passed, and as time passed, I found a greater desire to move further west, to leave behind Germania, and anything which reminded me of my past guilt. I was able to obtain several small jobs, avoiding debt and slavery, and being able to support myself to a comfortable degree, though I was still never inclined to stay in one place for very long. It is by sheer coincidence that I found myself in the company of men I thought I would never in my wildest dreams see again. At first I didn't recognize him, as he was not wearing the same murky clothing in which he had disguised himself all those years ago. Just a simple white cloak with a hood. But as I walked through a marketplace, I heard his voice ordering a small bag of food, and my mind made a connection to the voice that had pulled the life from my brother. I glanced in his direction, thinking it was just a trick of the mind. But it was no trick. The scarred jawline, now exploding with beard, he'd decided not to keep shaven, was unmistakably his. I followed him, expecting to see him now stationed in luxury and comfort, his reward for what he had completed. Instead, he appeared to have found himself a small set of rooms, located in a district of this city in the area where the lepers sought a coin and some pity. Having now seen where he lived, I fell back into old habits and began to watch him, waiting for him, as I would pray in the forest hoping to find a moment in which I could spring on him, ready to destroy his life the way he destroyed mine. But though this was an easy pattern to follow, it was also confusing. He didn't appear to be comfortable in life, but looked over his shoulder, frightened, as if expecting something to come by and attack him. He didn't expect me, but why would he? He had no idea who I was, not knowing my brother was not alone in those woods. But certainly something was off about him and his life. I finally secured an evening in which he had drunk himself into a stupor, 
And though he wanted back to the shack he called his house, he had no visitors, no witnesses, and none who sat outside his house begging for scraps. And as he went into and attempted to bar the door, I pushed my way in, both surprising him and ensuring he could not get to any weapons in time. I struck him until he fell unconscious, then tied him to a chair with some bowstring cords I'd located among his things. When he awoke, I questioned him, wanting to know as much as I could about him before I would end his life, bringing some peace for my brother's murder. The answers I got, however, turned my view of the past few years into a different sort of reflection. He'd been hired that day by the convoy, a sort of mercenary among mercenaries, and of the 15 to 20 that had succeeded in killing Erhard, he was the only one remaining. The rest had all vanished, either simply disappearing into thin air, or found dead, disfigured, and strangled. No murderer was ever caught, but the archer told me that he knew who the killer was. He's some kind of man, but he cannot die. He will not die. I know, for I shot and stabbed him myself. He didn't even make a noise when he was hurt. He just kept coming. I needed to know more about this man who tried to kill, but he told me nothing. Now I understood why he was so frightened, but knowing so little gave me no clue as to who followed him and wanted him as dead as I. So I left him tied up in his home and waited to see who'd come. He screamed and yelled, telling me I was leaving him for dead. I don't think he realized how little I cared for his well-being. I watched from across the street and waited and sometime in the late evening, the murderer came to call. But to call what I saw man stretched the meaning of the word. Something arrived that night looking for revenge, though it was impossibly thin, its arms and legs shrunken and gangly, and no way something a living person could have, even one who has not eaten in some time. He slithered into an open window, and after I heard the scream of the archer as he saw his death coming for him, I approached, kicking in the door. For the archer, I'd come too late. His chair lay sideways, his body sprawled, his eyes bulging and windpipe crushed, twitching in death's throes. But the shrunken, hideous figure that had done him in turned to me as I entered, and even in its deformed state, I recognized the face in moments. My brother stared back at me, or what remained of him. He stood before me wearing nothing but the tattered remains of the pointed hat, but modesty was not necessary at this point, for his body was that of a dried, desiccated corpse, stained brown by time spent in the bog swamp. Though dried out and colored the same as a slab of salted meat, his face remained almost a mirror image of the one I had seen on him prior to the death. Though even in the dark, his eyes glinted a yellow color, similar to that of a domestic cat in the moonlight. I recoiled, slamming the door behind me and ran. See, I've continued to run since that day. I know that through his direct murderers, I have suffered justice at his hands. I know that he still blames me for what happened that day, and whatever animates him cannot rest until I'm ready to join him. It's been quite an adventure, though. I've traveled, and I've seen much of the world I did not expect to see. I know he pursues me, having seen him in my travels out of the corner of my eye, leaving before he can track me down completely. Just as we did as young men, he pursues and tracks with expert skill. But I can hide. I can certainly hide. But perhaps I've finally eluded him. I've traveled to this land, away from the world I once knew, having learned the barbaric tongue of these northern lands, and have asked, have sought out the deepest places of loneliness, and, having crossed the channel twice, finally arrived here at this island. None but a few bardic groups came here, and even then with great difficulty. Even someone as dedicated as him cannot come here, as I would have seen him coming. Only by boat could he arrive, and only then if the waves did not destroy him first. 
Surely the forces of nature could destroy what remains of him. Even so, I believe I will succeed, that I will elude him, for I have developed a cough accompanied by blood and a general weakening of my body and spirit. I cannot run any further. I will not survive another trip. But despite being far from my home in this place, I believe the peace I seek will soon come. I will die, and my brother's revenge will no longer be necessary. And perhaps in the world beyond this one, we shall meet again as friends. I've prepared a burial site for myself. When it's time, I shall lay within and let my life ebb away. The story shall accompany me, and should you read it, know that I regret my actions toward my own kin. But his forgiveness is his to give, not mine to ask. And I hope we may both be judged for it when I awake from this world. This ends the translated documentation, and thus is presented the mystery. The rolled confession and tale were indeed found in a burial pit on Skellig Michael, but it is the pit itself that's the strangest of all. Other than the parchment, the pit itself was empty with no trace of a body. It had also been filled in and was otherwise remained untouched until the present day. It stands to reason that the teller may have simply told his story to throw off pursuers and traveled once more around the world, dying in an unmarked grave. But it doesn't explain the tattered remains of a burlap hat that was found buried alongside the writing. I hope you enjoyed The Hunt by Seth Paul, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash Seth dash Paul. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash S-E-T-H dash P-A-U-L. Look for his work on prior episodes his tongue-in-cheek movie commentaries floating around on the internet, and a few of his books, soon to be available in audiobook form as well. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. You know, I bet that we probably can't believe that old account. After all, people back then were a lot more gullible, easily tricked, could believe anything, but were a lot more rational and we know better. As technology marches on... Hold on, I'm getting a text. Hmm. I remember paying 180 bucks for geek security services, but I'll make sure they get my credit card number after the show. I guess freezing up and not doing anything doesn't exactly lead to good things. Of course, sometimes no good deed goes unpunished. As our second story unfolds, about food, hunger, and the unfortunate state of being, it pays to be just a little bit curious. Without further ado, I present to you, Eating Richly. Uh, add a double with cheese, please. Patrick leaned in close to me from the passenger seat. Can you add a Coke to that, too? I leaned out. Can we uh, have a Coke, too, please? I looked back at Patrick, who made a hand gesture, pulling his hands away from each other quickly. A large, please. We serve Pepsi products. Is that okay? Patrick made a face. Nah, skip the drink, please. Okay, uh, the total on the screen, correct? I was about to answer when Patrick rolled his eyes and pointed past the screen. Oh, jeez, another one of them? It's the second time this month I've seen somebody hanging around. Over by the locked front entrance, a guy, clearly not doing well for himself, if not exactly homeless, was trying to flag us down. Hey, can you help? Not looking for money, just need some food. From the seat behind me, Jim shook his head. Just get him something. It's late at night, the place is closed, he probably doesn't have a car. 
I looked at Jim in the river mirror as he took it upon himself to remind me why he always sat in the back seat of the car whenever we went somewhere. Patrick, it's your card. You want to do it? Hell no. We're already ordered. You can wait for the next person in line. You can't keep doing this. They just know people will pay for them, and all they do is show up all the time. And then they just bother everybody instead of getting real jobs. Jim folded his arms, a determined look on his face. Or at least from what I could see in the rear view, he tried to have a determined look. Maybe he does have a real job, Pat. He just doesn't have a car. Then how'd he get here? I don't see a bike. He just had someone drop him off so he can get free food. It's all a scam, and it's guys like you that keep it going. Your choice, Pat. All I know is, if I was starving... I'd like somebody to offer. Jim, if you were starving, you'd be out with resume in hand, showering at the Y, going to a soup kitchen to eat. Because you're a nerd like that. Don't make me be the bad guy here. While they bickered, I just watched the guy wave once more. I waved back and gave a non-committal shrug. I'm sorry, man. It's my buddy's card and we have to get back. The guy put his hands down and seemed a little defeated, but repeated, God bless, a few times, before pacing. Yeah, Jim, I think I'll have to agree with Pat this time. This guy seems a little out of it. I don't want him near the car. People like that need the help most. He's not going to go to a soup shelter. He probably doesn't even know where he is. The speaker crackled. Sir, is the order on the screen correct? Ah, uh, right. Yeah, yes, everything looks fine. I wanted to kick myself for getting our order was right on screen. We drove on, paid the lady at the window, then waited for a few moments while they got the bag prepared for us. I watched them place the greasy, paper-wrapped sandwiches in a bag, and suddenly, a late-night burger run didn't sound quite so wonderful. I think I'll just give them my sandwich. I don't even really want it. Pat sighed and punched the ceiling of the car. You do that and he'll just be back here tomorrow night. He won't go away. I shrugged. Hey, he eats tonight. There are loitering laws still in place, right? Win-win for everybody. We got our food and as we drove past the parking lot again, I saw the guy stumbling around and mumbling something to himself. Having not yet rolled the window up, I waved him over and handed him my sandwich. He thanked me, nodded his head a few dozen times, then went back to what he was doing, now just with food. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by Moriarty, available on Audible. Every week, we explore fears of all kinds. The dark, the uncomfortable, the unknown, and whatever it is looking in your window right now. But arguably, one of the greatest fears is the realization that everything you knew is wrong, that your world and everything in it are not quite what you thought they were. Recently, I just experienced that myself. I used to be able to sleep at night knowing that one of literature's greatest detectives was right about everything and that he would always eventually win against his arch nemesis Professor James Moriarty but then I listened to Moriarty the devil's game and suddenly I wasn't so sure anymore in this new audio production by Audible Moriarty isn't the villain we all know him to be but the victim of a strange conspiracy framed for murder and finding Sherlock Holmes, Scotland Yard, and a bevy of others all vying to catch him for their own reasons. But in his attempts to clear his name, what will the good professor have to do? And will he be able to live with the choices he has to make? The full cast production stars Dominic Monaghan from The Lord of the Rings and Lost as the professor himself, but he's joined by other familiar voices including fellow Lord of the Rings star Billy Boyd as Colonel Moran, 
Phil Lamar as Sherlock Holmes, and Lindsay Whistler as Rose Winslow. And no trip into the underworld of the late 19th century London would be complete without sound effects and music to place you right in the scene of the crime as if you were really there. Moriarty, the Devil's Game. It takes a villain to create one. Come see what I and many others have been sinking our ears into. You can learn more on Twitter at hashtag MoriartyXAudible. Visit audible.com slash listen to Moriarty and listen now. I couldn't make out much of his mumbling, but what I could sound sounded like he was reciting some kind of oath over and over. Not something mystical sounding. The more I listened, the more I was sure it was the post office creed. We got back on the road, which led back to Pat's house, having driven through old, quiet neighborhood back roads to get our burgers. I wasn't used to driving near downtown, but Pat insisted this place had great food even though I'd never heard of it. Considering he didn't know they sold Pepsi products, I wondered if he was telling me the whole truth, or if we drove all the way out here in the middle of the night, when we were already content to watch movies and pass out on the couch, after a good night of drinking and laughing, to do something else. So, Pat, are we out just for burgers, or... Hang on, he rustled through the bag. You better not have given him mine. Oh, oh, wait, there it is. He took a quick bite and by the face he made, I knew for certain he'd just picked a random burger place to visit. Just, uh, just like I remember. Make a left up here. Almost missing the road he was pointing at, I squealed the tires, trying to make the turn. Thankfully, this was the kind of area where most cops weren't likely to just be sitting in a parked car, waiting to catch speeders. Warn me next time, okay? Jim looked out the side window, and I could see growing alarm in his eyes. Despite Pat referring to him as a nerd, Jim wasn't, really. He was probably the most athletic among us, and he was the only one without glasses, compared to the two of us up front. Still, and all, he was a friend, even if he was a determined killjoy, and had rightfully earned his place in the back seat with all of his griping and finger pointing. This isn't the way back, you got the wrong street. No, we're going the right way. We're not going back to my place. Then where are we? Pat smiled, put his still wrapped burger between his legs, and reached into his pocket for a roll of dollar bills. Wait, no, we're not. Hell yeah, baby. Boys night out. I just got a promotion and drinks and entertainment are all on me. I didn't want to go. I'm guessing Jim didn't want to go either, but when Pat made up his mind about something, we all got dragged along into it. So I sighed. Fine, which road? I'll put it into my GPS. Jeez, don't get so excited about it now. No, no, congrats, man. I'm glad you're now... What is it you're doing again? I started clicking on my GPS app, but in big red letters, it informed me I could not put in the address while I was driving. Hang on, I have to stop the car. Pat, not really paying attention, started in on how he was now minor management, and yes... He would misuse his power as much as he could, because that was the kind of guy I was. Jim, on the other hand, squeezed the back of my seat. Brakes! I already st the thud reverberated through the car, and I slammed my brakes on. What the hell was that? Jim was still squeezing the headrest. Some guy looked like he was drunk. He stepped out onto the road. I felt my heart tighten, my fingers grow cold. I'd hit somebody. Perfect driving record, never even hit a squirrel. And now I'd run over somebody crossing the street. I stopped the car, opened the door, and made sure I had the keys in the pocket. The last thing I needed was for them to disappear somewhere, if things got really bad. 
We all got out and in the headlights, we saw what we assumed was a man in a thick black trench coat. I say assume because he was huge. It wasn't like a fat huge or bodybuilder huge or even tall huge. He was just all around big, like when kids play with action figures that aren't to scale. I felt like a G.I. Joe next to Stretch Armstrong or something. I wasn't sure at first if he was dead or alive. Either way, this was bad, but dead would have been... Now, that would make things a whole lot worse. Then I saw the coat rising and falling, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I looked at my two friends, who sort of nodded and shrugged as if to say, Yeah, if you're going to do something, go ahead, but uh, we'll be back here while you do it. I gulped, then moved toward the coat-covered mound in the road. Sir, sir, are you okay? Can, can you hear me? Can you tell me if anything hurts? The breathing continued, but there was no response. I looked around at the area nearby. The houses here were burnt out, long abandoned, or inhabited by squatters looking to smoke a few rocks or shoot up. If we couldn't get an ambulance out here, I don't think it would be possible for him to fit in my car and take him somewhere that he could find help. I figured the best thing to do would be to call 911, so I got my phone out. I imagined again, for a moment, that someone would try and stop me, argue that none of this was worth it, and that it would be best if we just left. Then I remembered that this wasn't a movie. And despite how my friends bickered and argued they were stupid, and they knew as well as I did that running away from something like this was just about the worst thing we could do. I called the dispatcher, who took my name and reminded me to be calm. Unfortunately, I couldn't recall the name of the street we were on, and Pat only knew where we were going, not how to get there. They just said to remain calm and wait, and emergency personnel would be there soon. I kept my phone on and relayed everything to the other two when we heard the man grunt. It was a deep, rumbling grunt, and immediately I tried again. Sir, excuse me, sir, are you all right? Uh, the man grunted once more, then said something in a low voice, uh, his back still to us. I'm fine, just a little hungry. To my surprise, Pat went back to the car and got his burger. So much for his values of not helping those less fortunate. Here, man, have this. Look, no hard feelings, okay? We were just going along and we just didn't see you. You, uh, you need money or something, too? As he handed the burger down to the man on the ground, his arm shot up, snatching the burger from Pat's hand. There was a very loud and unpleasant slurping sound as he finished the meal apparently in only a few seconds. Having had the burger and the wrapper crunched and tossed aside, the man stood. As I suspected, I was absolutely right. He was massive, not just tall, but wide as well. No, I don't need any money. I just need food. At this, the man turned toward Pat and grabbed him forcefully, two large midi hands wrapping around both his shoulder and his side. Pat began to scream. I stumbled forward to try and grab him, but of all things, Jim pulled me back. Jesus, look at him. The man had a thick, jowly face, and from his lower lip, two tusk-like teeth jutted. His eyes were small but bright red, looking almost like every blood vessel had blown in them at the same time. His nose was small but turned upward, like a pig or boar. He might have been a man, after all, but I've never seen a human being that looked like him before. I had to do something to rescue Pat from his thing's clutches, but before I could break free from Jim's grasp, the monster man had already opened its gigantic mouth and closed it on Pat's shoulder. I expected it to maybe swallow him whole or to rip him apart. Both would have been preferable to what actually happened. In the moment the thing bit him, Pat's scream began to warble and drop in tone, like the very sound was melting. His color drained, becoming paler by the second, until he was pure alabaster white. His body flopped, the bones and muscles seemingly vanishing, or more likely, 
reduced to nothing but goo. Even as he appeared to, well, melt wasn't the right word. It was more like he deflated, like a balloon at a birthday party with a sudden leak. The moan still hung from his lips as the thing pulled him and slipped him into its mouth, clothes and all. And like that, my friend of nearly fifteen years was just gone. There one moment, choking and making light of things, and a moment later vanishing into the maw of some gigantic creature like a piece of spaghetti. It then turned to look at both of us. I just need a little more. Please help me. I felt the grip on me loosen as Jim began to pull me away, though I didn't want to go. Not that I wanted to be the feast of this biggish monster, but that it made more sense to get back in the car and drive out of there before anything happened to the two of us. But I now saw, as it strode toward us, we would never have survived. Its long arms could have easily smashed the window and pulled us out, turning us into whatever it was that it called a meal. I followed Jim, blindly at first, toward the back of one of the houses. We rounded a corner, hoping to find a locked-in door or a shed or a raised back porch we could hide under. What we found instead was a backyard with grass nearly three feet high, filled with discarded, rusty junk, including an old refrigerator and car parts. Oh, and a board with the rusty nail in it. Jim found that one about three steps in. He screamed and clutched his wounded foot, the board still stuck on the bottom of the shoe. I tried to remove it, but he waved me away. I'll just walk on it. We can't slow down. It'll get us. We could hear him coming. It was, thankfully, slower than we were, or at least it gave the impression it was. We ran into the yards of at least a dozen houses until we found one that had the sort of raised porch we were looking for. Jim played with a loose piece of trellis that we could slide back into place, and thus, once we got through, we could make it look like it hadn't been touched. We slid it in, and together we moved into the back of the porch, close to the cement wall that made up the outer wall of the house. After a moment, we heard it stalking closer, could see the movement of its legs as it wandered along in search of its next target. We watched the shadows on the trellis board bend and shift until, at last, it went to move on. We waited for the sounds to retreat before we even thought to move. Jim moved first, scrabbling forward toward the broken trellis, to undo it when I suddenly heard loud stomping coming from the house behind me. Above, the door smashed in, and with sudden violence, two arms punched through the deck flooring. The hands wrapped around Jim, and he was lifted with ease. Got you. You forget how much you smelled me. I didn't see the process this time, but I could hear it as Jim experienced whatever had happened at Pat. The horrible noises followed by the slurping sounds. I did not move from the spot I was in, but I was vaguely aware that I was gathering up dust and throwing it on myself. I was in a sort of fugue state, having experienced something in one night that should not have been, and was letting my mind go on autopilot. I fell down into the dirt, and as I heard it stomping, trying to find where I'd gone, I didn't recall much until I woke up. I don't know if I'd fainted or just fallen asleep, but the traveling sound was long gone, followed by the muffled sound of talking. I quietly slid towards the hole in the porch, trying to get out, but also trying to determine where the noise was coming from. After assuring myself that nothing was going to grab me, when I put up my head and threw, I listened once more. It sounded like someone talking to a dispatcher. The ambulance I'd called. I pulled myself out and ran to it, finding my way through the maze of houses, until I saw my car in the blinking lights. I don't even recall what I said to them, as my thoughts were still haunted by the way that thing had swallowed my friends. But I do know that sometime after I was talking to them, a police car pulled up and asked me, at least slightly not that politely, to accompany them to the station. And here now I sit, in a room with very unpleasant lighting. Within a few minutes, a detective comes in, sits down, and asks me questions. 
questions about the friends that were with me. Questions about the sounds that came over my phone. The phone that I didn't hang up when the dispatcher called. That caught our screams, the panicked running. The sounds of my friends turning into some kind of mush before it ate them. The detective looks at me. Look, we know that something happened tonight, but we need your help to piece it all together. But we need you to calm down and look at it rationally. If you're currently on any sort of narcotics, you should let us know. I wasn't drinking. I don't do drugs. I saw what I saw. I understand. But if we're going to have any chance of catching the man who kidnapped your friends, we need to know the truth. They're not kidnapped. They're dead. He ate them. Yes, we know what you think you saw, but it's just not possible to have happened the way you describe. Look, if you need some time to collect your thoughts, we have a room here where you can sleep it off. Maybe you'll remember better then. I clenched my fingers, but I also nodded, understanding they will never believe this story. I watch him as he rises, gives me a pat on my shoulder, then returns to his duties outside. I put my head in my hands and wonder if maybe he's right, that maybe what I saw was too outlandish, that it was the state of a panicked mind, that the material on the phone call had a different explanation. And then I look outside the room, and I see the detectives have ordered a late night early morning meal. The one who was just speaking to me selects a carton of something either Thai or Chinese. He opens it and proceeds to scoop noodles out of it. Thick, wide noodles. And he slurps as they go into his mouth. And before I lose consciousness again, I feel my whole world shatter. I hope you enjoyed Eating Richly by Seth Paul, as performed by yours truly. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by June's Journey. Not every mysterious thing in the world needs to be something beyond the veil of the world we know. Something that would drive us to the brink of madness if we were to realize it. No, sometimes a good mystery is only as far away as your mobile device. And I can tell you whether it's right when I wake up, during a calm lunch hour, or just before heading to sleep for some nice, pleasant nightmares. I can tease my brain with a few puzzles from June's journey. Yeah, take your Android, iOS, or PC loaded with Facebook games back to a golden age of detective work as you help amateur sleuth June solve mysteries around her home on Orchid Island, beginning with the strange incidents around the death of June's sister. What really happened and why? Click through scene after scene of colorful locales to locate more clues to solve the mystery. And even if you think you've finished that, don't worry. Each week there are new places to explore, new cases to solve, and new clues to unravel. But if you crave further challenges with friends and rival detectives like, join a league and put your puzzle-solving skills to the test. Or if you're all solved out, spruce up your island homestead a bit and make it a, your own little virtual paradise away from home. Yes, friends, join me in the game 30 million fans and counting in the exciting adventure that's free to download. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PCs through Facebook games. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash Seth dash Paul. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash S-E-T-H dash P-A-U-L. Buy his books, buy his audio work, 
Buy him dinner, too, if you're so inclined. Just don't buy into anything he says. His opinion's not worth very much. If you do decide to stop by the Pofalma, please leave Seth a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. As a reminder, if you decide to give tonight's talented author stories a read, please consider leaving him a kind quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. Be sure to let them know that you heard about them here on this program, and that me, Otis Jiry, sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure Samuel would much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. If you can. <laughs>
to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and add free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>